all want our message to get across, especially when we're tasked with communicating on behalf of the church. And we may workshop content and wording forever, trying to be as clear as we possibly can. But the power of the words themselves can be amplified or undermined by the very letter forms that make up these words. Variables like font, weight, or size, and even the line spacing may make the difference between guiding someone through your content and making them skim or skip it altogether. On this episode of the MyCom Church Marketing Podcast, classes in session for Typography 101. Thank you, everybody, for listening. My name is Dan Wunderlich. I'm a United Methodist pastor, and I'm joined, as always, by my co-host, our Methodist marketing guru, Darby Jones. How are you today, Darby? I'm great, Dan. How are you? I'm doing great. And on the topic of typography, I wanted to ask you, Darby, do you have a favorite font? I don't know. Not really. uh, I think it's my favorite thing is the hunt oh yeah it's it's about finding the right font for the right purpose so it's always changing i'm always discovering new fonts that i love but i'll answer the question the the font at the very top of the photoshop list of fonts the aerial (laughs) uh rounded (laughs) bold nice uh, that's a that's a go-to one okay you know helvetica new (laughs) sounds good and that voice you how about you well i'm a big fan of a font called sentinel which looks sort of like an updated version of an old typewriter font Uh, it brings a nice modern feel while also having a touch of the classic and uh, we will get into font selection in a little bit and that voice you hear laughing at us nerding out over type is another type (laughs) nerd himself troy dossett who is the in-house graphic designer at united methodist communications troy thanks for being with us today Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. And uh, before we jump into the topic, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, the work you do at United Methodist Communications, and then if you have any favorite fonts, what are some of them? Okay. I have a degree in marketing and PR. I I didn't come by any of this naturally. It's kind of odd. And I fell into an ad agency world right at the last semester of college and never got out of it, starting kind of as as an intern person. And I owned a small ad, ad agency in Kentucky for a while. That was a million years ago and in my <laughs> early 20s. And I learned that a really fast lesson about uh, I don't want to own a business and be that young and have that many people's lives in my sure, hands. Yeah. It was it was really a lot of stress. And so I got out of that and I moved to Nashville because I always loved Nashville and uh, wanted to kind of be some part of the creative music business. But that was right at the time when it was really transitioning. It was kind of crashing. And so I stayed on doing some freelance here and some freelance in Kentucky. And I worked for myself for many, many years. Somewhere along that period, about eight years ago, UMCOM found me and I started being a contract designer for them. And that lasted until they asked me this year to come in in-house and help them build a creative department. And that's what got me basically to this chair. So it's been a good time here in Nashville. And it's been a really great new position for me because, uh, you know, it's like I knew a lot of the folks and I've watched a lot of things come and go and I've dealt with their fonts forever. <laughs> and it's been a challenge because it seems boring in some ways. And, and you know, I've, I've had to deal with the brand promise and things like that. Like it's just everything's so locked in. But then now I get to see another side of it. And I get to do, some, do more and also create a new path for some new things that they're going to be doing. But uh, I, I don't really have great font. I mean, I'm just like Darby. I am obsessed with fonts and I will pour over them in all the sites depending on the project I'm working on. But my go-to for everything right now it seems to be the Avenir family yeah. because there's so many great options in that. And I say it a lot. A lot of my work needs to be condensed because people are writing too much <laughs> and uh, I've got to fit a lot into a space. Yeah. But and that was an upgrade from Century Gothic. I wrote that down because you know that's so boring. But I loved Century Gothic because it was so big and round. And I hate serifs. I, I could not find a favorite serif. I just don't like them. I don't know why I, I never go to them, and I'm forced into them all the time. I think times nightmare about times or something times you hear you did me wrong yeah. early on well and uh, my so that's my, my wife is a college professor and so i help her see when the students are cheating on uh, which fonts they're <laughs> using to fill space and line spacing and margins and all that but but if all this talk has your head spinning or you're getting a headache or you're saying dan troy darby i have no clue what you're talking about then you are in the right place don't turn this podcast off it, this is for you so hopefully you have heard through our gibberish that we know what we're talking about and now we want to help you know what what we're talking about. So let's start at the 30,000 foot level. Uh, Troy, as a designer, as a creative, as someone who's building a creative team uh, to help communicate the message of the gospel, uh, specifically through the lens of the United Methodist Church, to make this sound as important as it possibly can, let me ask you this simple question. Why is typography important? Well, typography, wow, that was a great lead up for why <laughs> this is important. You know, the most important thing about a font is, especially in this day and age, and everybody is so busy, there's so many multiple messages coming at us, is it's got to touch the heart of the viewer. It's got to make sense. It's got to 
get whatever message you're trying to get across, across quickly, fast, efficiently, all that kind of stuff. You've got to make them read. And so the font is what does it because we're talking about headlines here usually. And then, then if we get them in through the headline, then we got to get them to the bottom of the page or to the right. bottom of the piece. And, and, and they've got to understand it. So we have to frame this in a positive way. And so every bit of it, people take it for granted. But it's very important. It's very important. It absolutely is. And to build on what you said, it's so important to think about typography as a unit. How does everything look together? Because you can choose all the right fonts. You can go out and find the fonts that Darby and Troy and I named, and you can throw them into your page layout program or your design program, or maybe you can put them into Canva or some simple program like that. But you can still have a disaster on your hands. We have all seen the church bulletin or the order of worship that just gives you a (laughs) headache when you look at it. Even if you're using the proper font, but then you can open up something like your hymnal or the United Methodist Book of Worship, uh, and they use a very standard serif Palatino linotype, but the way that it's laid out, the way that the hierarchy works together, uh, it's really, it's a good thing to look at, and it it helps people get through it. And and like you were talking about, Troy, you do so many different kinds of designs uh, from from long text to social media images and things like that. We live in a Mm -hmm. world where people's attention is fleeting, and Typography is often the first thing that catches people's eye. It might be the image, it might be the colors, but the typography may be the thing that keeps people looking at it and and reading it, right? Yes, and I do think that with the artists that are creating type these days, I think there is something to be said for, if you're looking at, um, I mean, the font could look the same, you could compare two or three fonts, but there could be a G or there could be a Y, or there's always one character possibly that is just a little special. And if you can get that into your piece, it will make a difference. People will kind of wonder what that is. I, I don't know how to explain it any better that it just looks maybe a little odd shaped, a little different than what they're used to. And it will spark an idea or maybe well, it will spark them to want to read your idea, I guess I should yeah, say. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a British type designer, Matthew Carter, put it this way. He said, type is a beautiful group of letters, not just a group of beautiful letters. So again, it's a, it's a beautiful group of letters. They have to work together well, not just a group of beautiful letters because you can find a font that looks great, but if it doesn't look right for what you're actually using it for, then it really isn't the right font. Well, let's jump into some typography basics. The first is just a little bit of definition of terms. And the first thing I wanted to touch on again, very briefly, because this is super technical and it may not ever come up in anything that you're doing, but if you do get the opportunity to work with a professional designer like Troy or someone in your community, maybe you work with a local design firm, it's good to understand this terminology and some of these concepts. And the first one is a typeface versus a font. And this comes from the days of of letter press type when you actually had each individual letter kind of in metal glued to a block of wood that you then put into a printing press. And so the typeface was the style of the letters where the font was the, you know, that letter E in that size and they were usually kept in drawers. And so the font would be the drawer of those letters in that size and the typeface would be all the various italics, bold and all the sizes for that design. Designer Norbert Florendo put it this way, font is what you use typeface is what you see. And another designer, Nick Sherman, compares it to the concept of a song versus an MP3. So a song is what you have a reaction to, where MP3 is the technical thing delivering that song to you. And that kind of ties into what you said there at the beginning, Troy, that typography is not just about the letters themselves, but it's about the effect that it has on the reader. Right. This is a feeling. It, what, what does that person take away from that and, and that could be the group like you said it could be a long word it could be a short word or whatever but you've got to sell it and, and what are you making them feel when they look at that absolutely you know, visually and now let's take a moment to thank our sponsors and by the way this is a new thing so if the listeners would like to place an ad with my podcast get in touch with us so without further ado we'd like to thank the upper room hosting a discovery weekend is a great way to help your middle school youth experience god's love empower your high schoolers to become leaders and get your whole church involved in youth ministry. Learn more about this brand new program from The Upper Room at discovery.upperroom.org. That's discovery.upperroom.org. 
Well, the letters themselves have some characteristics to it, and there's more than just this, but these are some basic ones. The baseline, that's the line that the letters all sit on. Uh, cap height is how tall, like a capital letter, will go. The X height is roughly the height of your lowercase letters, especially X height, that's where it comes from, about how high a lowercase X might be. Ascenders and descenders are those little sticks coming up from the B or down from the P. And then serifs, Troy expressed his distaste for serifs earlier. Those are those little points <laughs> sticking off uh, the ends of letters. And there are more parts to that. Um, we'll have some links in the show notes uh, to some websites that help you visualize these things. But those are some terms that you might use if you're in conversation with a designer. Uh, but let's get into some more font types. This is what the kind of terminology you'll actually be looking for when you go out to font websites or even in your design program to start selecting a font. You're going to look at terms like serif or sans serif, whether it has those little uh, sticks or ticks on the end of the letter forms or not. Serif has them. Sans serif doesn't have them. Slab serif has those little ticks, but they tend to be a little bit thicker or they might resemble sort of a rectangle. Uh, Sentinel, the font that I said was my favorite, that's a slab serif that I'm the opposite of Troy. I like big fat serifs hanging <laughs> off my letters. Uh, <laughs> script fonts look like cursive. And especially now, one of the, the hot trends kind of right now, uh, and who knows if it'll still be a trend by the time you're listening to this podcast, is a script kind of brush fonts, fonts that look like they were written with a paintbrush. Uh, then you've got... Yeah, and a grunge, yeah. with a grunge effect, usually. Yeah. I mean, that's really... I mean, it, I guess it's been hot for a while, but it still maintains people are wanting that that urban grunge current effect. They, they sometimes make it... They feel they're contemporary if they have. Speaking of that urban craving, I, I found a website today called homelessfonts.org. Wow. And they actually got these 10 homeless people to develop their own typeface. And <laughs> they're really cool. They're just handwritten and just totally unique. Everyone has their own character. And you have that some of the, like the calligraphy or the, uh -huh. the painted brush sort of look. And uh, you can totally buy their fonts and support That's a good cause. That's a cool well. idea that somebody would even consider the, their creativity in that and bring them into that circle and, and then actually probably find a way to give them some money or something yeah. back. That's fantastic. Yeah, That's great. And we will talk about buying fonts a little bit later in the conversation. That's an important thing to talk about when we talk about uh, especially design for the church is supporting the designers who do this work. Uh, but yeah, the difference between uh, even a serif sans serif and slab serif typeface and then a more handwriting or script look that can give your project, you know, it'll feel completely different. And I think what people are kind of tapping into is this handmade kind of culture and design really tends to swing from one end of the pendulum to the other. And uh, certainly in the 90s, we had a really grunge feel and it wasn't so much handwriting as it was looking like like you had gotten something screen printed, but it got messed up or it got scratched up. And mm -hmm. then we kind of you swung over into the super clean, everything is sans serif, real thin, real geometric letters. And now we're kind of swinging back to a handmade. Two other um, font types that I wanted to talk about that you may encounter. One is called inline, which looks like a big fat font with a kind of a, a skinny version of the letter in the middle. Think the Jurassic Park logo, essentially, is an inline font. Uh, and then now companies are starting to play with layered fonts. And so you have your basic letters, but then in a program like Photoshop or another design program, this won't really work in like Microsoft Word or your page layout program for your bulletin. But in a design program, you can layer the fonts on top of one of the, another so you can add uh, shading or you can add outlines or you can really create a whole bunch of looks all using the same letter forms. Uh, so Troy, you said you're not a serif guy. Are there any other types of fonts that you use heavily and regularly in your work? Well, I obviously do use serifs because I do believe in using contrasting fonts when you're designing a piece. Yeah. And whether that probably is sticking to probably two main fonts as, as the old rule goes, I, I will definitely, because they say serifs are still the the font that people can read more easily, that it will help the eye flow through a piece. Uh, I don't know that I always agree with that, and especially because on web, well, online it does not. Then it's the opposite, right? It's I think it's, you're supposed to be a little bit more sans serif when you're online, and that's a little confusing for a guy that has to design <laughs> one thing and really need to pa pass I don't really have time to, to do double work right. and, and, that, and then when you then, then when you show it to somebody they think it's a mistake because you're all oh, this is for web this whatever so you have to kind of like you know relax a little bit on these on these rules they're not always rigid but I deal with a lot of this script stuff right now it, it does seem like people are loving a flowing headline a softer headline 
it makes them feel a little bit more personal to the subject probably of what we do so it seems so we're doing a lot of easter stuff right now so i guess that's what's on my brain yeah. i've been surprised at what people are reacting to and how positive it's been to some of this uh flowy sweetness uh, of a script or maybe a hand done like it was uh, very personal but I don't have any name. If you were asking for a name or something, I don't have any names. Because I, just like Darby said, the one good thing about the new InDesign, and I don't even mean to get too far off into certain programs, but it's just that they have finally broken it down into groups. If you're looking for a font that you already have on your system, they have broken down to these to these main areas that you just listed, serif, sans serif, uh, slab serif. And that has helped you really regroup your thousands and yes. thousands of fonts that are already on your computer. Yeah. And it helps you be a, a more efficient uh, – because you can get really worn out with this, right? Trying things out and testing. And they're so, they're so alike. Everything you – know, a lot of these are so alike. They've been copied. They've, uh, they just have a little tweak to them, and then somebody gives them a new name. So uh, it's hard to pick out one. But I will say for anybody that, that is getting used to fonts that they need to pick their fonts to be more or less in the super family. Meaning where, say you have, I don't want to use Helvetica, maybe I could use the Avenir that I, that I said, that's got a lot of wides and condensed and, and italics and obliques and all this kind of stuff to it. So that when you are doing a piece and you're scared to, to venture out into other fonts, you can use same fonts within the same family and it will still give a completely different feel and look for quotes and pullouts and things like that. And it's a real effective way to stay safe, stay sans serif, whatever family, but just get the largest group of options within one name. And I think that would really help what you're doing as well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And boring, absolutely. You know? And that leads us into the final two characteristics that you're going to want to look at when you're picking a font. One is font weights. And if all you've really ever done is typed in Times New Roman and Word, you kind of have regular, bold, and italics. Well, fonts nowadays have lots and lots of weights to them. And sometimes they're expressed in numbers. So you might see a 200, a 400, and a 700. So the 200 would be a lighter, thinner letter. And then the 700 would be the thicker, more on the bold end. And then some fonts like Avenir, you'll see them by a word. So it might be light, medium, book, bold, black. And you'll you'll get to know what all these terms mean as you begin to work with fonts. And like Troy said, finding a font that has multiple weights is such a... a it's a lifesaver, really, uh, because when you don't have the time to look for that second font, but you still want to create contrast within your piece, you can combine a bold for your headline and maybe a medium or a book for your body text. And then the last one is widths, which Troy has mentioned a couple times. You've got your regular width, you've got your condensed, and you've got your extended. And now what we're talking about are fonts that are specifically designed to be condensed and extended. We're not talking about going into Photoshop and messing with the letter widths. That is a terrible way uh, to do that. You actually want to let the type designer do that. Well, let's mm -hmm. uh, move into choosing fonts. And the first thing is we do need to understand font licenses and costs because I think a a lot of times churches, especially smaller churches, really all churches, we're always looking for something free. If we can find something free, that money can then be used for missions or for um, supporting something else or just you know, keeping the lights on. And so we're always looking for free things. And especially design wise, we like free fonts, but we need to pay close attention to what the license allows you to do and not do. And there are a lot of fonts you can find online that are labeled free for personal use. And then there are uh, fonts that come with commercial licenses. And then there are some fonts that are free for whatever you want to do. Now, as far as I know, Darby, Troy, and I, I know myself, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, I would assume Troy and Darby are not lawyers. So we're not telling you what you legally can and cannot do. But Troy, when you're looking at font licenses, for me, the tricky part is churches are nonprofit, but that doesn't necessarily make us a personal use, but at the same time, we're not necessarily a commercial use. How do you kind of That's understand right. or it, what guidance would you give wow. churches? That is so tough because uh, you don't want to give anybody the bad advice and they do anything that seems bad or, you know, with because a license is a, is a real word. It kind of scares people right off the bat thinking, oh, I can't use this or whatever. I think that the best, and this could be uh, do as I say, not as I do kind of thing too, because <laughs> sometimes I'm, I'm forced into going to certain free sites and, and grab something that's unique. I do know that Google Fonts is a great way. Yes. It's open source. And that is a really great depository of fonts that people could use that would give you some variety. There are the third party stuff such as font squirrel and defont, uh, especially font squirrel, that's one of the better ones I mean, that really, really spells out the license on the front end so you can feel better about it if you want to read through that, if you're really going to be diligent of checking out that font license. 
but it's almost impossible to keep. You have to decide if you're going to keep on top of it or not, because you'll you, before you know it, you're going to end up with some of these fonts that, that you don't know where they're coming from. Right. You know, people are copying them; they're all over. The, also, if you would deal with anybody that has clients that give you fonts, then you now you've got their fonts. They're doing you're doing a project for them. You've inherited their fonts. You don't know where that came from. And there's a lot of gray areas and stuff. So you can just try to, I would say Google fonts are great. Yes. And then of course, then there's the, the paid for sites and then you can, own, and, and not all fonts are, are expensive. I mean, That's maybe correct. sometimes depending on what you're doing, maybe if it pertains to your logo, your brand, it's very important for you to spend that little extra money to have what you need. But as you said, churches are usually on a limited budget. I will say free isn't always free. And you can get a font from one of these places. And, and in addition to maybe downloading malware or, or uh, certain things, uh, spam viruses, that kind of thing, you'll you'll download a font and you're in love with the font. And, and usually a lot of these uh, sites will give you a chance to type out the font in their site so you can see what that font looks like. And that really makes you fall in love yeah, with the font. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And then you download it. And this happens to me so many times. And you're, you're, you're going along and you're typing and it has no punctuation. <laughs> yep. Or it has no ital, or it has, you know, or it'll have a period, but it won't have an apostrophe. And now you've done all this work and you don't have that one piece. And, and so many times I've had to like then bring in another font because I don't have time to go and find another whole font that I'm just as much in love with. And that's what happens because people are building these fonts and they're not finishing them out and they're publishing them quick and they're putting them on some of these free sites. And so that's what we call limited glyphs. And if people don't know what a glyph is, that's, that's a representation of a character. A character is probably the character itself, the individual letter, the number, that kind of thing. The glyph is what it can do can it be bold can it be a towel can it be this can it be that and so it's limited glyphs it has no punctuation often the free ones they have limited styles sometimes they obviously don't have the full family no one's going to sit there and make you that full family for free so you don't get the bold and the italics that you're looking for and then uh sometimes they can be boring too and it's not worth having that free fine I, it, there's all kinds of ways of looking at it but those are some of my points i wanted to make about Free isn't always free. That's absolutely <laughs> true. And and uh, they may be beautiful looking letters, but the person who made the font doesn't know how to do spacing very well. Uh, and there then you, you end up seeing a gigantic gap between letters and it looks like you put in a space right. when you didn't. Uh, so uh, as Troy said, Google Fonts is a really great place to start because there are tons and tons of fonts there. They're all open source. They're free and legal for you to use. Uh, there are also, uh, like he said, some inexpensive font places that still offer high quality fonts. There are uh, some web sites like creativemarket.com, designmarket.com, or designcuts.com. These are some sites where designers can sell their products and some of the fonts are, are not that expensive. But a real important thing that Troy mentioned that I want to highlight is when you're selecting something, especially maybe it's for your logo or your primary font for your church, try to pay for that one unless there's a really good free one that really, really works. You want to find something solid and you want to make sure that you're allowed to use it. It would be not mm -hmm. that that the designer lives in your town and is going to drive by your church and see your church sign and sue your church, but just as as good citizens, as good designers, and as good Christians, we should be sponsoring, uh, we should be supporting the people who are doing this work. And as always, you can always get in contact with United Methodist Communications, and there are people on staff like Darby and like Troy who are here to answer your questions. So if we have you quaking in your boots, worried that your church website is going to get flagged by the FBI for something you weren't supposed to do, call <laughs> Troy and, and he'll calm you down. Well, And some other things to look at talking, especially when we get into digital use, is what does the license allow you to do? Some licenses just say, here, this is a font, you can use it. Uh, but especially if you're a church that has put a little bit of time into your website and maybe you've figured out how to use a custom font on your website, make sure that your license covers font usage. And again, Google fonts not only are legal to use on websites, but a lot of the popular website builders already have Google fonts built in. And so as you're as you're choosing a font for a project, as always, you should try to to imagine what it's going to actually look like. Like Troy mentioned earlier, there is a difference between print and digital. And serif was very popular in print because on paper it helped your eye flow from character to character. Uh, but online, sans serif was popular because it, when you get into actual, the letters being made up by pixels, it would get really blurry and it would kind of get hard to read. And as screens get higher and higher definition, it becomes easier to use serifs online. But interestingly mm -hmm. enough, we're now looking at smaller and smaller screens screens and more of our web traffic is becoming tablet and phone based. So even if someone has a gigantic high resolution monitor, 
on their phone screen, the serifs may still cause a problem. So I think Troy's guideline of serif in print, sans serif and digital is still a good one to follow. And we've talked about, does the font have the right vibe? Does it give the right experience for the user when they look at it? Because you can type out the same word in a bunch of different fonts and then just ask yourself, how does this make me feel? Does this communicate the right message? Like Troy was saying, right now, brush fonts are not only popular, but they're extra popular in the church around Easter. And so I don't know what it is, but the word Easter in a brush font just Mm -hmm. looks right, right, uh, at least in the moment. And then a question is, will that vibe last? Uh, So if you're just doing a social media graphic that is literally going to pop on people's radar and then leave within half a day and no one's ever going to see it again, you can pick a font that maybe feels right for this time. But we've all seen those companies or those churches or those organizations where the type you can tell was designed in the 1970s. And you have to ask yourself, especially if you're making your church's logo, will this still look right 10, 20, 30 years from now? Troy, do you have any guidance for uh, choosing a font that's timeless? What what you're saying there, because the last thing I want to do is encourage anybody to be so scared to use to be bold enough or brave enough yeah. to use a different font for their logo that, that everybody ends up looking the same or boring. I mean, I don't want to encourage that. I, I just think that uh, it's a gut feeling to, to designers like me, but you, and I would hope to anybody you could, you want to design something, let it sit around a while, please make it small, make it big, make it, act like it's on a shirt you can there's all these tools online where you can pop your logo into something to see what it's like here and there you should test those things out so that you can see you know that will work oh, that's going to be great you, you could do a little small focus group of the people within the church or within your area or, or people that, that you know that can give you some really honest opinions and, and you don't always have to take that but you don't want to just be Helvetica right. I mean I don't I, you know I don't want to encourage that but what you have to do is I would say you have to look at how many characters your name is you have to figure out the focus you know if it's certain certain church you know not everything has to be the same size of the official name of the church you know it's like you can just put uh, the biggest part of the name at the top and then a methodist church underneath it whatever and, it, and those two things can be contrasting fonts yes obviously you can go online you can search around you can get ideas everywhere but there's many factors and almost there's not one rule for every one. But I really want to encourage people to stay brave and just try different things. But just don't jump into it. Like Now, if it's social media, like you said, I love that. The way you said, if it's going to go away in 15 minutes, yeah, do whatever. Like, have fun with it. But if it's your brand, if, it, if it's got to last, put some time into it. Put some thought into it. Print it out. Stare at it. Go away from it. Come back next week. Don't rush it and you'll figure it out. Yes, absolutely. And, and uh, part of that exploration and... I think we've mentioned this, is type the actual words you will be using in that font. So for example, my last name starts with a W. And I also worked for Mm -hmm. 10 years in college campus ministry for the Methodist Church at a Wesley Foundation. Wesley starts with a W. Um, I hate the letter W, but I deal (laughs) with it all the time. Uh, And so selecting a font, I always need to see what the capital W looks like because I'm likely going to be using it or seeing it all the time. So type the name of your church, type the name of your city, type the name of your pastors, type common phrases like worship or community or fellowship. Um, Try just, just open up your bulletin file, hit control A and switch the font and just look at how the words look. You might find a letter that you you find it, that you just are going to hate yourself for having to look at every day for the next five or 10 years. Again, we don't want to scare you away from trying things, but you also might find those fun things like Troy mentioned. You might find that one letter in the font that looks amazing and it actually ends up elevating the piece. And that is so important too. And I, if you're trying out fonts, then sometimes in addition to maybe trying that with just your but type out the entire alphabet and then see what every letter is in that because there could be something that will spark something in you just by seeing the alphabet typed out as well uh, on these lines that they allow you to do online and such like that because it will there will always be a q or an r something just a little bit of a flourish from one of the characters that'll make your special logo your word look really well look really nice And another honest truth part about this is that Darby, Troy, and I are the kind of people that love looking at fonts. And perhaps sometimes we've spent an hour looking at fonts saying that we're working when it's really just self-care because we like letters and we like design. But if you uh, and your church, whether you're the pastor or whether you're the communications director or designer working for a church, if they find the right two or three fonts for their brand, whether it's the same fonts that the Methodist Church uses or you select something unique, that kind of boundary 
may help make you a faster designer because you have a limited palette to choose from. And again, you don't necessarily want to use the same thoughts on everything all the time, but there is a layer or there is a level of consistency, especially with branding, that if you can use the same fonts in the same weights consistently, people in your community will begin to recognize it Absolutely. and that will help your marketing. I mean, it's almost like there's, I'm sure there's a good ratio, but you're going to decide what the fonts are for your brand. And then everything you put out, the body copy, maybe the subheads, maybe whatever's at the bottom should match those fonts. And then you can be a little bit playful with, with headlines and subheads. If you're in the bulletin, I mean, yes, you, there's some ways for no matter what, then the body copy of it. Well, why not? You know, why, why have that ch keep changing? If it's something for your children's ministry or something else, everything should just kind of, should just look like it was planned. And it also makes your life easier. Like you said, you can just, this is your limited font. You're That's going to be your, your brand standards for your personal church. And you're going to use that every time, but maybe still leave way on the headlines and big big moments but uh the other stuff could stay the same and it would be great absolutely and when we start to get into things like layout uh and uh, as we move towards the end of this episode we we do need to talk about layout because like we said the the general effect of the font can be affected by the layout and so we need to think about things like spacing what is the space between letters look like and in a program like photoshop or InDesign or canva some of the more uh full featured design programs, you can actually adjust the spacing in between individual letters. So for example, if you have a capital T next to a capital A, a well done font will already shorten that up for you. Uh, but maybe a free font that you grabbed off of a site, they'll look really far apart because the end of the T and the end of the A will line up. But then you have this big gap underneath the arm of the T and beside the uh, side of the A. This is one of those things where we really need, need a video podcast, but you get what I'm saying. Say, this is not... <laughs> It's, it's not very visual. Yeah. So hang, hang with us, folks. The spacing between letters is important. The spacing between lines is important. Um, how you align text can be important. Churches really love to align things to the center. It's just something that seems to be in our, <laughs> our traditional blood is to align things to center, but sometimes it's going to look better to keep it in a traditional block aligned to the left. Um, line length is important. You don't want your lines to be too short or too long. You want it to help whatever makes the reading experience easier. So we can give you some, some generally accepted rules, like you want 40 to 70 characters per line, but really look at it and say, would I read this? Or ask someone else, because you're, you may be biased as a designer. Ask someone else, would you actually read this? Line length is a, is a huge pet peeve. I hate when I see a long line and mm -hmm. I, when I go to the next line, I end up skipping two or three lines because I'm not sure where I am. And then I either think the author's crazy or I'm crazy because I'm not understanding what's happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. 40 to 70 characters is a great rule of thumb. Sure. And as you're designing things like your website, you're going to want to pay attention to the hierarchy because a lot of times we we scan websites now. We don't read every word and that may hurt your feeling as someone that labored over every word to make sure it was super correct on your about me page when people are really just going to be looking at the different headings down the page. And so make sure that the things you want people to read are bold, make sure that the spacing looks good and that it actually encourages people to read. And there's a really great example of hierarchies like this on on umcom.org slash tools slash fonts. That page explains to you the official fonts that Troy went over earlier. It gives you links to purchase them if you'd like to use them at your church, but they also just give a really great visual representation of how to mix weights and sizes and lay them out down a page to help people read. They and, talk, and many yeah, examples of how not to use it too. <laughs> I mean, I think that we, we do a lot of things there to show people you can't do this and you know, it just really helps you know what just visually right there what to do. Now, now go ahead. I just interrupted my favorite one this is the whole reason i'm sitting in this chair this is my my pet peeve of all pet peeves and go ahead and say all it. right well I, i'll just i'll is, title it me crazy. i'll title it and then you can explain it it's called orphans and widows with which the church should always care about so troy tell us about orphans and oh widows. my gosh there is no reason in the world that ever we should leave a poor little word on a line by itself there's always a way to to give it a friend or bring it up to the rest of the group it no one likes to be the redhead stepchild. So just something has to be done. People are leaving. And that goes to the next one, which I wrote in. I think in life, there should, there's no reason for hyphenation ever. There's Turn it off. Do not ever put a hyphenated word. Bring it down. Bring it up. Do something. Change a word. I hate hyphens at the end of any paragraphs, but that's a designer's a woe of mine. But the orphans and the widows are... They're just, um, you see it all the time in magazines. You see it in newspapers. I don't understand. I guess because people are just doing it so fast paced. They just don't realize how bad that looks to leave that word just hanging. It, it, it just visually, it's just not very pleasing. Absolutely. Yeah. So just when, to let you know, Troy, 
uh, in all of our emails. Oh gosh. In the HTML, I specifically go line by line and add a non-breaking space between the last two oh. words, so that depending on the screen size of the, of the recipient's um, device. There'll never be a. There'll never be there, widow, yeah. and that's and that's all you got to do. And then that's a rule. It's done. And I t and anybody that comes to work with me or any new project, they know my boss knows. Everybody knows. I have a real big problem with this. It's just like it's always been that way with orphans and widows because it looks bad, and it'll be in the weirdest spot. The line will just be t maybe one line, maybe two lines, and then you got this third line that's just a like a three letter word. It's just like it just seems careless. And uh, boy, I'm really going on a rant here, but I just <laughs> really think people need to. Pay attention to this. Awesome. Yeah, so so we can have single <laughs> words that hang off. Sometimes, too, you'll see the first line of a paragraph on a page and then the rest of the paragraph on the next page or the opposite, uh, where the oh, last yeah, line yeah. of a paragraph will show up at the top of the next page. And it just really... We're trying to help people read, right? Our goal is to communicate, and these are all very technical things, but they will help or hinder uh, your community's willingness and desire to read what you're putting out. Absolutely. Another pet peeve of mine is, I think it's called rag, and rag is basically what the right side of a paragraph looks like, like the how jagged the the text is. So okay, on, the, so okay. on the left side, yes. it's always you know straight down, That's right. but on the right, it's always either a little bit more flat, depending on the rag, or jaggedy. And yes. and you can play around with the margins and and Word or whatever you know program you're in, and you can make the length or the width of the line less or more so that you'll either have a straighter rag. So or everything's a, a little bit more balanced within the paragraph, I think is probably what you're right, getting at. So it's right. not so, so, it, so yeah. So you don't have a widow. So you have three lines on that line, but you have 14 words above it or whatever, and you bring in your margins. And it's a nice, pleasant way to make everything look balanced. Right. I think automatically. Right, right. And I, and I know it's hard for everybody to worry about those things every time, but it does end up making such a nicer looking piece. If you don't have it stretched out, like what you're talking about. Yeah. And, and, and if you're making a, a brochure or, or, or some kind of promotion uh, and, and you have a good bit of text, it just doesn't look good to have a really jaggedy yeah, right side yeah, of a text. Yeah. And all you have to do is play around with the margins a little bit to make it look pleasing. That's right. Well, if you haven't picked up on it yet, I think we're going to need a typography 201 class. Uh, and so we may <laughs> revisit this topic uh, a couple months down the road. And so if you have any questions uh, that we can clarify things that we've said today, you can email us at podcast at umcom.org. Or if there's any type or font based questions that you just encounter on a regular basis that you would love for us to answer either on the podcast or just by writing you back, you can write into podcast at umcom.org podcast at umcom.org. Troy, thanks so much for your time today. We really appreciate it, man. Thanks for letting me rant on and on. And on, and on <laughs> yeah, and on. it took till the end, but we finally found the thing I, that I pushes know. Troy over up. the edge. <laughs> Well, we also want to hear from you. What are some of your favorite fonts? Do you secretly uh, have a an inward desire to use Comic Sans or Papyrus, but uh, the design culture has just beaten it out of you? Or do you have great resources for type or fonts that we haven't mentioned on the show? Uh, you can write those in as well, podcast at umcom.org. And we just might share your thoughts, your favorite fonts, and your font struggles here on the podcast. And finally, if you have found this podcast to be helpful and you'd like to make sure that other church communicators like yourself find this resource, the two biggest things you can do is share this episode with your friends and colleagues and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Google Play Music, or whatever platform you're listening to this on right now. Thank you again so much for listening to the MyCom Church Marketing Podcast.